You know, we have a very diverse audience. We, there are people here from Switzerland, from Spain, from Australia, uh, from the Far East, from just really all over the world. And that's at least a testament to the power of the internet, that information flows around. We have a lot of doctors here too, and I find it really encouraging uh, that there's a lot of, uh, you know, not just lay people, but medical doctors who have an application for this information in the work that they do. Um, we're going to be hearing next from a medical doctor. Dr. Donald Forrester helps people break bad habits and helps them to improve their health. And uh, he was a, he spent more than 30 years at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, he has served as physician leader. He's been a, a doctor there. He's had a number of roles. Um, and he was chief of preventive medicine and patient education. Several years ago, he and his wife, Beth, uh, were decided to switch to a vegan diet after reading the China study. And uh, being inspired by the work of T. Colin Campbell that was reported on, he also got involved with PCRM, which is Neil Bernard's organization. We heard from Dr. Bernard last night. And uh, um, has sort of his practice took a different direction where he really has been using a lot of these principles to help people, you know, get cured of diabetes, for example, and greatly improve a lot of aspects of their health. He's also the medical director of Meals for Health, the program where we went into the food bank and was just an integral part of that program who interfaced with the patients and guided them, got them off their medications. We had some very sick people with a lot of problems and and uh, he was so encouraging to them. And I think he's an inspiration to all of us. He's an inspiration to doctors. And he is the kind of doctor, frankly, that we'd all like to have. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Don Forrester. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's a real honor to talk to you today about something I feel very passionate about. Um, I have a disclaimer. I don't have a book. I haven't done a DVD. It's a little intimidating to be on the stage and follow a guy that's written 26 books and <laughs> be the setup man for Jeff Novick, who's probably the most knowledgeable registered dietitian that I've ever come across and I'm a real fan of. And if he ever decides to do anything else, he could become a stand-up comedian <laughs> at any venue. But uh, it's a real honor to thank Jeff for, and thank you for your attendance. I'm hoping that you'll get some interesting concepts out of this discussion to aid you in your journey to make you healthier. So today I've put together sort of a, a different talk than what I normally do. Uh, it's called Reversing the Tragedy of Our Health Commons, Moving Upstream. And I'm going to first, it's sort of three segments of the talk. We're going to talk a little bit about some context and definitions, and then I'm going to talk about, go a little bit in depth into diabetes and obesity, and then we're going to really flash through arterial disease pretty quickly once you get the concepts from the first two, and then we're going to sort of wrap it together with a fish story, and uh, I'm going to ask your help at helping the medical industry turn itself around. I was trained as a chemical engineer. I'm a board-certified family medicine doc. I'm also a certified physician executive, and I was trained as a patient safety officer at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City. I retired from Kaiser after 30 years of seeing patients and trying to improve systems of care there. And as Jeff mentioned, in the last two or three years of my practice, I, was, I, I went back to something that I had been involved with in the 1980s. That was when we were just figuring out that broccoli might be good for you. And got involved with doing primary and secondary prevention with my patients. It was a much more rewarding way to practice. So my colleagues started asking me to give talks, and that led to these talks that I've been giving for the last four or five years. Uh, so I give educational presentations to lay people and also CME, uh, Continuing Education Group for Physicians. I do some clinical work, like Jeff mentioned, with Meals for Health. I see patients at the McDougall Clinic when he brings in the Whole Foods employees. We'll talk briefly about that. And I do some writing. Uh, I just got an article published called A Path to uh, World-Class Service for Medical Organizations in the Physician Executive Journal. Uh, I'd like to start with the upstream-downstream story, which I actually heard in 1985 by Don Ardell, who wrote the story. And it seems like it's been years since the people in the town of Downstream remember spotting the first bodies in the river. Many of the old timers remember how spartan the facilities were, how it was very difficult to rescue people that were trapped in the raging waters. They would lose rescuers and very, very, rescue very few people. But they, re they responded admirably to the challenge. They built a brand new hospital right by the water's edge. 
motorboats ready to go at a moment's notice to get people out of the river. They're so busy pulling things, people out of the river that nobody's sort of asking questions and how the bodies are getting in there upstream to begin with, which is a perfect analogy for the uh, healthcare industry these days. Everybody's so busy, nobody's asking questions about what's going on upstream. So we're gonna move upstream today. And we're gonna find out how the, what the bodies are in the river. Today we'll talk about cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease a little bit in a slightly different way than I think you've used, used to hearing it. But if you look at the number three cause up there, which often surprises people, that's the leading, uh, third leading cause of death in the country. This is 2002 data. The numbers have changed over the last 10 years, but basically they're relatively the same at this point, although cancer is closing in on cardiovascular disease a little bit. Uh, but the third leading cause of preventable death in the country is medical care. So if you do some of the things you've been hearing this weekend, you'll be less likely to get medical care, and if you're less likely to get medical care, then the medical industry will have a less chance of killing you. <laughs> but we're not just talking about death, we're talking about disease and cost. Uh, diabetes, just looking at diabetes, Neil talked a little bit about this. Uh, in addition to being very costly and very prevalent, and the incidences are going up dramatically. Uh, it's the leading cause of blindness between 20 and 75. Almost half of the new causes of kidney failure are diabetic. Uh, heart attack rate and stroke rates are much more elevated in uh, diabetics. And even beyond that, uh, you know, when you come to these talks, you know something's going to go wrong. So my laptop died on the plane coming over. And uh, thank you, Jeff. And Jeff. Uh, Nelson was nice enough to lend me his more modern version. So some of the slides are going to have a little quirkiness on them, like this one. Uh, this is a study in children, and the first, uh, the actual first bar there, the yellow one, is normal children and their quality of life survey. The box over on the far side is the quality of life with children with cancer. The one in the middle is obese children. So we're not talking about just death, we're not talking about just disease, we're talking about quality of life. Just a quick survey in the room. How many people in here follow pretty much what you would say a vegan diet or plant-based diet? Okay, down. How about vegetarian of one flavor or another? Okay, so pretty much preaching to the choir here. Uh, how many people feel they're getting a good value for their healthcare dollar these days? We got one. Okay. We can talk afterwards. I'd love to see where you're getting your care. So this is the value of our health care dollar. We pay $2.4 trillion, or 17% of our gross domestic product, and this is what it gets us. The World Health Organization ranks us 37th out of the country, 191 countries in the world. All the industrialized countries are above us. We are first in spending, by a long shot but 36th in life expectancy, 39th in infant mortality, 42nd in adult male mortality, and 43rd in female mortality. In my opinion, over 80% of this is waste and is avoidable cost. By the end of the talk, you'll get a sense for where this is. First, some definitions. Primary prevention is preventing a disease from happening. Secondary prevention is you've got the disease and you cure it, so you're not on any medication or anything. Tertiary prevention is the treatment and control of complications. Now, the medical industry could have charged off in any of these directions or all three of them, but they picked one direction. We charged off in tertiary prevention, such that in the 2007 study, 51% of adults and children are taking one or more medication for a chronic condition. Over age 65, about 25% of our citizens are on five or more medications. Scarier even than that is under age 21, 25% of children are on medications for chronic conditions. That gives us basically a mopping up care system where everybody's sitting here cleaning up the water and nobody's turning off the spigots. This is a slide's courtesy of Hans Diehl. Uh, you'll notice a lot of my slides come from a lot of presenters. One of my things I do in my sort of retirement since I left Kaiser, I go to a lot of talks and I bum slides off people. <laughs> Number one, they do a lot better than I do. They've written books and DVDs. And number two, I believe one of our ways out of this is a collaboration among professionals, but also lay people and professionals as well. So this is a collaborative effort. So I thank Hans and his, his you know, the leader for the Coronary Health Improvement Project, the CHIP Project. And we're gonna run through the history of manufacturing industries real quick. 
probably haven't thought about this too much, but in the late 1800s, basically if you wanted something made, you went to a craftsman and they made it for you. Limited inventory, variable quality, high cost, single piece manufacturing. But if you had a problem, the craftsman solved your problems. This is where many physicians are trapped today. They're in their offices, doing the best they can. One person comes in, they take the history and physical, and they try and craft the solution for them. That lasted until the early 1900s, and then we had mass production, correct? Uh, Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, low variety. You could have any color car you wanted, as long as it was black, right? Had assembly lines, division of labor. If there was a problem, management solved the, layer, the problem. The people on the assembly line were just going, pushing things out. They had to ask permission to go to the restroom. This is often called Taylor management theory. Many of our medical corporations are trapped in this model. You may know bureaucracy or been involved with bureaucracies, if not the healthcare organizations. You know, you've got a bureaucratic structure, all these meetings and activity going on, not adding anything to the frontline workers or the, or the, or the people they're servicing. Uh, lodge cultures, you know. If you want to get along, go along. Leading myth in the lodge culture. Lone Ranger mythology. Mask man rides in. Just supposed to do what you're told. Nobody knows why he's wearing the mask, where he gets the money for the silver bullets or the white horse, or who the uh, subservient that follows him around called Tonto, which means stupid in Spanish. But you, know, you get this in these uh, layered management tailored bureaucracies. These things come down from the top, and you're just supposed to do what you're told. This is where a lot of the organizations in medicine are trapped. And then in, when I was growing up, I was born in 1948, and in the 1950s, for those of you who were around in that time, if something was made in Japan, was it quality? That was a junk. But after World War II, uh, the army needed somebody to count the Japanese, so they hired this guy, Dr. Deming, and he went over and count, do some population statistics for him. But at the meantime, he actually taught the Japanese quality improvement, statistical process control, eliminating errors, waste in all its form, higher quality, lower cost. And this involved solution of problems with frontline professionals working in teams. That was the Deming model. And uh, actually, the Japan's National Quality Award is named after Dr. Deming, who lived outside, just outside Washington, D.C. in Chevy Chase, Maryland, actually. So Intermountain Healthcare, where Brent James's institute has been training people in that for the last, oh, since 1986 he's been there. Just a couple of problems. You know, if you go into a hospital for an elective inf abdominal procedure, there's a 2 to 4% chance you will get an infection if that hospital is working up to the Joint Commission standards. They took this on as a problem, and over a, about a six-year period, they dropped it to 0.4%. They were eventually able to go down to 0.1%. And what their message is, is that never compare yourself to the average. Always compare yourself to as good as you can be. And you can improve care and save money. They tackled a slightly more complex problem with adverse drug reactions. There's a lot of this. Of course, if you follow a plant-based diet and take care of yourself, you won't be on a drug, so you don't have to worry about this. But they looked at adverse drug reactions and were able to prevent two-thirds of them and saving of $3 million a year in a 300-bed hospital. More recently, uh, there's been a push for lean production in Six Sigma. I don't know how many of you have heard these terms, but it's sort of high variety, small batches, uh, looking at the parts per million defects, which is the Six Sigma. It has to do with statistical deviation, variation. I'm not going to get into that. But it's basically how the airline industry became so safe over the last 40 years. Where in this model, everybody is responsible for quality. So we've gone from the Craftsman model to the Ford assembly line problem pro approach to things to the total quality management to the everybody is responsible. So how hazardous is healthcare? We've got some good news. Uh, anesthesiology is a 5.2 sigma, which means you know, they only have a death about one in a million one in a little over 100,000. Uh, it's in the regulated industry standpoint. Healthcare, though, as a whole, is down there with bungee jumping and mountain climbing, as far as errors. And that's, giving the, that's given the numbers that I quoted on the earlier 
slide. You'll see a different view of those numbers a little later. It's interesting that most of the people in this room probably went through grade school and high school. And if you look at the upper right-hand corner there, you'll see that if you were an A student, you were allowed to have up to 10 defects out of 100 usually, 90 to 100 being an A score. So we're actually honed to think not as accurately as you need when you get into complex industries. And medicine has certainly become com more complex. When I started 30 years ago, we had two drugs for hypertension, two classes of drugs. Now we've got 12. So how do we get out of this mess we're in? Well, we're working in systems. You're a complex system as an individual. We've got complex organizations. Basically, a system is a set of interrelated elements organized to serve a particular function or to seek a particular goal. And there's sort of two types of systems. There's static systems, which are like the assembly lines. We talked about the post-op infections. They're complicated, predictable, stable, and you get gradual improvement. So if you introduce a change, you get a predictable result. Adaptive or complex systems are complex, they're a little unpredictable, they're dynamic, they're always changing, so you can introduce the same change at two different times and get two different results. But you can, if you know what you're doing with complex systems, get dramatic results, and you're gonna see that. And going on a plant-based diet is a good example of that. As a matter of fact, if you go with the proper design and you go with the proper science, you can actually get dramatic breakthroughs where you get dramatic improvements. For instance, a non-medical example would be if you build a building that is so, so efficient for heating and air conditioning, it's so well insulated, you will not have to have a heat and air conditioning system. So you not only have, don't have to pay to install it, you don't have to pay to run it after that. There's a building, a six-story building in Southern California here, actually won an award. They're not hooked up to the sewage system. Uh, a truck drives up about twice a week and takes off the compost from the human sewage. It's actually set up to self-compost. So they don't have to pay sewer bills. For the purpose of this talk, tertiary prevention basically just means throwing more and more money and getting less and less in return. But when you start talking about secondary prevention and primary prevention, you start getting dramatic breakthroughs in health across a wide variety of illness. You can treat, when I was curing diabetics, I was also taking them off their blood pressure and their, hyper, and their, and their lipid, lipid medicines. So how do you get to change in complex system? There are different levers of change, and the smallest lever is like an isolated event. You may change if you're given an isolated event. You read a, something like, you get a statistic, or you see something. Stories are powerful metaphors. Everybody's talking about Bill Clinton. That's a story. We tell these metaphors, and that you may have changed into your current way of eating based on some stories you heard. Or maybe somebody who's a trusted relationship got you to change, like Jeff related last night when he went vegan, right? Sabrina came down and said, we're vegan. <laughs> also, Bill Clinton actually, when he got his first uh, surgery done in New York, actually had that procedure done at the hospital that had the highest morbidity and mortality for that procedure in the state of New York. Now, he didn't know that at the time, but he went there because he trusted his healthcare professionals. Finally, your function and your goals. But today we're gonna to talk about the most powerful levels, which is your belief system, which is how we navigate complex society. The world's gotten more complex in the last 40 years. At least I think it's gotten more complex. I think most people would agree with that. So how do we navigate that system? We have belief systems. So let's talk about diabetes uh, briefly. Now this is, what happened the 12 years at Kaiser Permanente in the North Valley where I practiced up in Sacramento and Roseville, the incidence of diabetes doubled over that 12 year period. Now my way of thinking, this is a testimonial to the failure of the medical organization I was working with because they could make a case that if what they were doing, they weren't doing what they were doing, that curve would be worse, but they're certainly not lowering the incidence of disease, changing the deflection of the curve or turning it around. The paradigm or belief around diabetes, most of my patients think they have a sugar processing problem and it's because of sugars, but actually they've got a sugar processing problem because of the fats. I mean, this isn't new information. We figured out that fat in the diet, that's supposed to be a down arrow, regulates the genes that produce the mitochondria, which burn the sugars. You'll recognize the slide, I borrowed it from Carol, Carolyn Trapp and uh, she works for Neil, so. That's a familiar slide. 
Uh, in 2004, we found out that fat in the diet actually increases your insulin resistance, insulin resistance. So these little sugar molecules, the insulin doesn't throw them into the cells. It interferes with that. And then once they get in the cells, the fat interferes with the mitochondria that actually burn the, the sugars. And then they figured out that a vegan diet actually reduces the fat. And then Dr. Barnard ran a study, and the lines don't show up real well, but uh, the carbohydrate counting diet of the American Diabetic Association diet gave this result versus the low-fat vegan diet. And the hemoglobin A1C here is sort of a measure of how well your diabetes is controlled over about a four to six week period. So you can see it's superior. Not only that, down here you can see that almost half the people who went on the low-fat vegan diet were off their medications or reduced their medicines, whereas only 25% of the American Diabetic Association diet. Clearly, the American Diabetic Association diet is an inferior diet. Clearly, that's what's being taught today. And the reason you need to avoid animal products is fairly obvious when you look at the percentage of fat in animal products compared to the percentage of fat in plant products. Even getting down to white tuna at 16%, but everybody's off on salmon at 54%, uh, eating a lot of salmon. But when you start getting down to broccoli, beans, rice, sweet potatoes, and yams, they're a very low percentage. That's why you have to eliminate animal fat, animal products. Here's a gentleman I had the uh, privilege of taking care of in uh, March. He's one of, he was a whole food employee. Ben uh, came in weighing at 313, his fasting sugars, Blood sugar was 159, cholesterol 185, low density was 124, blood pressure was 130 over 80, and he was on all these medications. The top two are for his diabetes, he was on a blood pressure medicine, Lipitor for his cholesterol. One of the things we do when we put people in this, this is a live-in program where they actually came to the McDougall program and he did an eight-day program. So they're gonna get fed correctly, and we know that their blood pressures and their sugars are gonna go down dramatically, so we take them off medication. We keep them on the lipid medicine so that they will actually see the difference in the diet makes. Then we tend to pull them off at the end of the program. So after eight days, you can see that his fasting sugars were actually better, 30 points better, than when he was on two types of sugar-lowering medicines. His cholesterol had dropped 63 points. His blood pressures were the same, but he was on no blood pressure medicine at that point. His reflux was totally gone. His energy was, go was way high. At that point, we just continued his Lipitor and he, John McDougall will give them a blood slip and say, nah, sometime in the next few months, repeat it. And when Ben did that, his sugar was virtually normal, his cholesterol was 122 on no medication, and he was on absolutely no medications at all. Now, of course, these numbers are sort of interesting, but then you've got to look at him, okay? This is a before and after picture of Ben. Uh, I got an email from him the other day and he's actually up to 60 pounds loss at this point since March. His vision has improved 70 points, and he basically says he's a new man. So here's a change where we actually put him on a diet to improve his diabetes and blood pressure, but he also had all these other results. And that's an example of going upstream, applying the correct science with the correct design. We're designed as herbivores, not as carnivores or so when you violate your basic design, you get into trouble. So it's no secret that if we were designed to eat plants and we start eating non-plants, we're gonna get bad results. So I'm practicing at Kaiser and I'm starting to give these talks and I come across this paper, which was written 12 years before I started giving the talks. And here's a 21 patients, they put in a live-in program actually in, right above Auburn at the Weimar Clinic, it's an Adventist program. These were people who had diabetes for 12 years, painful distal neuropathy for three and a half years, put them in a 25-day program, low-fat vegan, ad libitum diet, where they ate fewer calories than when they came in, no refined sugars or meat substitutes or free fats, exercising 30 minutes or two miles. And the amazing thing is in four to 16 days, 17%, 17 of these 21 people had complete relief of the painful nerve damage they had reversed the nerve damage in their legs. Now these are the people I was giving Egr Tegretol and Elevil to. I was pushing pills. I didn't even know this existed. So you know, have to ask yourself, I'm working for Kaiser Permanente, large organization, prides itself on prevention and prepaid care, yet I don't know about this article, and most of the doctors I talk to don't either. 
Uh, in addition, the patients lost weight, their triglycerides were down, cholesterols were down, blood pressure was down, 80% were off their high blood pressure medicines. And after four years, 71% were following the diet. Actually, the number would be more like 89 or 90%, but they didn't count two of the people who had actually died. So the new beliefs around type 2 diabetes that I think you can walk away from this talk with are it's the fats in the diet, both animal and vegetable, that cause the problem. Type 2 diabetes can be reversed and cured. The complications can actually be made better. Uh, earlier is always better. It's always better to address these things earlier than later. And the only caution is that if you're on blood, low, lower sugar medicines, you better be careful because you can get into trouble. So you want to definitely work with your docs about this. This talk is giving you information. I'm not giving you medical advice as I would as a clinician. The best reference I've seen on this is Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes, that book, which is what I started use, recommending to my patients and the ones that started following that were the ones that cured their diabetes. Let's talk about obesity. <clears throat> It was always on my list of things. People would always, they're always told, bring your list into your doctor, right? They never gave us any more time when they made that statement, but people would come with their lists. And somewhere it was on, probably usually was, I'd like to lose some weight. It's clearly a bigger problem in this country. It's gone up 50% over the last 40 years. Uh, actually, in our uh, six to 11-year-old group, it's gone up 400%, and 12 to 19-year-olds, it's gone up 300%. Dan Pereiro lets me use his cartoons. Uh, thinks it's time to change the restroom signs for the new America. <laughs> Obesity is not about genetics. You can move people around. It's about the food environment they're in. Here's, uh, here's David on loan to the U.S. after six months. I don't... I don't know how many of you have ever stood at the foot of David in Italy. It's impressive. I mean, this guy's, what, 20 feet tall? And he's up on a six-foot pedestal. Remarkable. I don't think they ought to loan him out to the U.S., at least till we fix our food environment. So if you look at the standard American diet, sort of a busy slide, but take-home message here is over the last 40 years, the only thing we're eating less of is vegetables. And even some of the good things, like upping the fruits, those are in uh, dried fruits that are put in processed food. So we're consuming, on average, about four or 500 calories extra a day. It's no reason we have an obesity problem in this country. So what are the key concepts for us to know about obesity? It would be nice if the answer was as simple as flying over to another parking lot as a thin pigeon is talking to the fat pigeon eating at some fast food restaurant we won't name. Uh, but the concepts are ad libitum diet, calorie density, exercise, and food addiction. This is a study of the ad libitum diet. The ad libitum diet means you eat when you're hungry. You cannot, you are hardwired not to be hungry, as you will see. When you try and go on a restricted calorie diet to lose weight, only 4% of, of people are successful at the end of two years. So you get this yo-yoing effect. But this was a study where they took 22 adults for 21 days in Hawaii, and they put them on what used to be the standard Hawaiian diet, which was very much oriented toward taro and sweet potatoes. And they went from the standard American diet up here, SAD, to a study diet with lots of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, not refined. They lowered their calorie daily intake from 2,600 to 1,600, and they weren't hungry because they were eating when they were hungry. Their average weight loss was 22 pounds. Their blood pressures went down in each category. Cholesterols went down, triglycerides went down, and their fasting sugars went down. Calorie density is the second concept that's important. This is from Jeff Novick. This is the sort of information I needed before I retired. Uh, Calories per pound, in the literature it's calories per gram, but nobody knows what a gram is in this country, even though I was told when I was in junior high school we were gonna to go to the metric system. Uh, but everybody knows what a pound is, because we buy it in those units. Vegetables on average weigh about 100 calories per pound. Fruits are about 300, unrefined carbohydrates are 500, 
Beans are about 600. Fatty protein sources like beef are about 1,000. Refined carbohydrates are about 1,400. Junk food is 2,300. Nuts and seeds are 2,800. And oils are 4,000. So if you tend to eat at the bottom upper part of this in the lower caloric density, you're going to lose weight. As a matter of fact, I need about 2,500 calories a day if I'm not very active. If I eat nothing but vegetables, I'd have to eat 25 pounds of vegetables a day. I couldn't eat 25 pounds of vegetables a day. This, a lot of patients will say, well, you know, doc, I need to lose weight because they need to replace my knees, but they won't replace my knees until I lose weight. And I can't lose weight because I can't exercise. exercise. Well, if you, keep your, if you keep your average caloric intake below about, on average, below about 450, you'll lose weight even sitting on a couch with a remote. It's possible. So anytime you uh, refine foods, typically if, if it's a low caloric density food, it will increase your fillage. You'll feel fuller. That's high water content, high fiber, and increased bulk. When processed it, they usually add fat, add sugar, take out fiber. Uh, so that's why it's better to eat off the lower, lower side of the calories. So you know, this, these are slides are from Jeff Novick. Uh, which do you think is more filling at 100 calories? How about uh, a cup of cashews versus six potatoes? So visually, you can see what we're talking about, caloric density. Uh, exercise is important, but the reason is when you exercise, your appetite goes down and your metabolism goes up. I mean, most of you have gone through the exercise of trying to figure out how much you have to exercise to burn off a candy bar. It's pretty distressing when you do that. But you get benefits much beyond that. So basically, when you uh, both exercise and low-fat diets increase the leptin, which is a hormone that your fat cells make, and that decreases your appetite and increases your peripheral metabolism. The problem is, after several days of a restricted caloric diet, your leptin levels are about 50% of what they were. So your appetite's going up, and your peripheral metabolism is going down, and you're trying to lose weight. And this is not a pretty picture, and that's why restricted caloric diets do not work. So if you tie exercise level to caloric density, so like I mentioned, if you stay below about 400 or 450, you can be sedentary and lose weight. If you're moderately exercised, 400 to 800, you can actually lose weight. Elite athletes can eat in this range and still lose weight. If you're above about 1,300, if you're eating really a lot of concentrated calorie food, you can be training for the Boston Marathon and still be gaining weight. Food addiction is an important issue because everybody looks at people who are overfat. They say, this is weak will. Well, not so much weak will probably is biochemistry. And we don't have time to go into all of them, but we're going to pick on cheese. Uh, and this is a slide from uh, Breaking the Food Seduction book by Neil, which is a very good book for people who want to lose weight. Uh, has seven steps. But if you look at the stages of addiction, this is a slide I borrowed from uh, Doug Lyle. If you're eating a whole foods diet and then all of a sudden you get exposed to junk foods, you sort of get a high. But you, you keep doing that, you sort of adapt. It's like jumping into a swimming pool when it's cold and after a few minutes it's no longer cold. But if you take that food away, you go through an abstinence and recovery phase and then pretty soon you're back where you started eating whole foods again. And to that stage four, which is recovery, you can get through that at different speeds depending on how you approach your, your weight loss. If you just do a water fast for a day or two, usually you can do it that way. Juice fast for two or three days. If you just transition to whole foods, a lot of people will take up to three weeks before they get through this period. That's why like for the 21 day kickstart program, we often recommend and Dr. Barnard recommends going three weeks on a whole foods diet. That way your system has a chance to adjust and you're feeling as good about the food you're eating as you were on the old diet before you started. <clears throat> the cheese industry has people in this country broken up into market segments and 20% are cheese cravers. These are people who eat cheese straight out of the package every day. I had a lot of patients say, oh, I can make all these changes, doc. Just don't take my cheese away from me. I need that. Um, cheese enhancers are people that put cheese on everything. Now, casein, which is the main protein in cheese, is metabolized to eight different casomorphins or morphine-like substances in the gut that are, that are actually absorbed. So this is about opiate addiction. 
So our beliefs about foods, our paradigms, or our belief drive our behaviors. And information is important to our beliefs. So here's a guy ordering cheese, although the lady says, would you like congealed bovine mammary secretions with that? So if we can get you to change your belief around the food, you might change your behaviors. So if you believe a food is good and necessary, you may have seen some of these commercials, it drives us to behave in a certain way as we shop, cook, and eat. But you can get information that can start to question your beliefs. And just some information, you know, cow's milk today is different than the cow's milk was 50 years ago because these cows are pregnant for 305 days every the year. So they've got an incredible amount of natural hormone in milk. So there was one study done on children where they actually a glass of cow's milk, if you feed a, like an eight-year-old girl a glass of cow's milk, that's as much estrogen in the milk as she produces in her body in the entire day. You just doubled her sex hormone exposure. It, I have all these guys that are using milk as some sort of recovery drink. I'm, I'm a cyclist. And uh, it's interesting, they'll drink cow's milk, but they won't drink soy milk because of the phytoestrogens. But the study they did on men who consumed two glasses of milk, that within one or two hours, their male hormone dropped 20% and their female hormone went up 25%. So you start getting information about the actual what's in some of the foods you eat. That might change. Yeah, it might start to question your beliefs. Let's how about a little bit more information. Uh, aluminum. We need aluminum. We don't need much of it. Get enough in the diet. But it's maybe been linked to Alzheimer's. Leading source of, in the diet is cheese. Uh, why does cheese have aluminum in it? Cheese has aluminum in it because it makes it easier to slice, melt, and it has softer texture. Dioxin is one of the most carcinogenic substances known to man. It's a product of burning plastics. The recommended FDA safe level is less than 120 femtograms per day. It's considered safe. In Hagen-Dazs ice cream, there's 49,000 femtograms in a scoop. In a Pizza Hut slice of pizza, it's 105,000, based on a study in 2002. The half-life of dioxin in your body is about one to seven years. So, you can further question your beliefs, and then once you get to a tipping point or a paradigm shift, you might actually change your behavior. <laughs> Just one another one of those many, many examples of why men should listen to their wives. I warned you about the hormones you and all that meat and dairy you eat, a little udder forming there and got a little tail down here. So if we change our beliefs from a food is good for us to a food isn't good to us, to a food is harmful for us, to a food is harmful, addictive, and contains poisons, and change your behaviors a little bit. There are a couple tips about losing weight. Uh, sequencing actually helps. They've done studies, uh, feed a small, low-calorie salad of 50 calories, you consume 70% less calories at that meal if you eat the salad first. A larger salad gives you 12% less. A large uh, bowl of vegetable soup, low-fat, 20% less calories. On the other hand, if you go to an American salad bar, and you load up with the high fat and the chicken and the cheese, you're actually going to eat 10% more calories. And if you drink fruit juice before your meals, 100 calories of fruit juice, actually get, you'll eat 20% more calories. So sequencing is important. Don't drink your calories. And best beverages are water and tea with a squeeze of citrus. You can go on a plant-based diet and be fat. John McDougall wrote a very nice newsletter called The Fat Vegan. And, uh, you can eat at restaurants where they have high fat food. You can eat a lot of refined foods such as sugar and flour. You, you can have processed oils, drink a lot of calories, and uh, basically avoid food with labels. So you can actually avoid being a fat vegan if you do those things. I just had to put a slide in about childhood obesity just to make a point. It's an adult problem. Children don't decide on menus, shop for food, prepare food, drive themselves to fast food restaurants, have the ability to be well informed, and adults need to set a good example because that's how your kids learn. Here's uh, Buzzkill the Lunch Lady, and remember kids, not only is milk a fattening health hazard, but when you're drinking milk, it means a sad and lonely calf somewhere isn't. So we need a new food pyramid. And basically, the PCRM plate is about as good as I've seen. 
And the reason we need a new food pyramid is because Americans are starting to look like pyramids. The old one clearly is not working. As an engineer, trained as an engineer at, at Lehigh, a chemical engineer, I'm a pragmatist, if nothing else. So you saw Bruce and Hillary, right? And you saw one to two pounds per week, all this weight loss, and there's their numbers. So obesity, ad libitum diet, eat when you're hungry diet is the only one that works, new food pyramid, caloric density is more important than calories, exercise within context, food addiction, not weak will, and sequencing is useful, don't drink your calories. Jeff Novick has DVDs, a DVD called Calorie Density, uh, it's called uh, Eating More, Weighing Less, and Living Longer, which I highly recommend. You can get off his website or the McDougal website. And Doug Lyle has one called Losing Weight Without Losing Your Mind, which is interesting. And the book by Neil, of course, uh, Breaking Your Food Seduction. Arterial disease. This is going to be a flash forward. I'm going to skip through most of these slides just so I can get to the last part of the talk, sort of bring it all together for you. We studied blockages. We now know the biochemistry, the nitrous oxide system. We know that arterial or aortic coronary disease is very common. In 15 to 19 year olds, if you've been given the standard American diet, there are 100% of lesions in the aorta, which is the large vessel, and 50% in one of your coronaries, the right coronary and they're already starting to get raised. By 30 to 34 years, everybody's got it in their coronary aortic, but 60% are raised lesions, and three quarters of people have coronary artery disease. So virtually everybody in this room, unless you were born and raised a vegan, has coronary artery disease. To the extent you're going on a plant-based diet appropriately, you can reverse that over time. The studies came out, Esselstyn showed that if you get cholesterol below 150, uh, and that may take medication, by the way, that after 10 years, there was no recurrence of heart attacks. These are people who are very sick. Esselstyn also showed the same thing on a, people who did nothing, they continued to progress at 20% of their blockages. If they were on statins to lower their cholesterol, plus one on the American Heart Association diets, they still progressed. But if they went on the low-fat, plant-based diet, it was 7% regression. They actually opened up their coronaries. So this happens fairly quickly because of the nitrous oxide system. This is a blood flow study in hearts. And you can see that just in three weeks, the blood flow went up in both these essays. So you can turn these things around fairly quickly and stabilize them. I'm going to run through this just to get I want to make a comment about back pain. I used to see a lot of people with back pain get a lot of x-rays. You see these narrow discs. The interesting thing is they've done studies in Scandinavia that show that the way that your, your lumbar vertebrae get their nutrition is through these two arteries. Each vertebrae get them coming off the back of the aorta, the big vessel. And they found, and then your disc spaces, which are those little cushions between your vertebrae, actually get their nutrition by diffusion, where the nutrition just diffuses. They found that people that had narrow discs have blocked arteries. So all these people I used to say, oh, what's that? I say, oh, that's just wear and tear. It's not wear and tear. It's a marker for, coronary, for arterial disease. So it's a systemic disease. OK. Let's talk about the tragedy of our health commons. I got 15 minutes, <clears throat> maybe 20 if Jeff's luck, if he's in a good mood. Tragedy of our health commons, fish story. Resources that are owned in common or shared among communities are basically called commons. Air, water. It was popularized by Garrett Hardy in 1968, but the original idea was actually published in 1833. And the idea is that if you're on a pasture and you've all got a herd of cows, if you individually add cows to your own herd, it may be to your advantage, but the pasture will die. So the commons actually fails. I would like to suggest to you that we need to view our health as a commons. And since decisions that you make regarding your health affect other people in the healthcare industry and in your community, just a different way of thinking about health. So what we need to do is move from conventional capitalism to what's called natural capitalism. This idea is from a book by Paul Hawken and the Lovins. 
Conventional capitalism basically is unsustainable versus sustainable for natural. It neglects natural and human capital. Human capital being, you know, fire the older workers, hire the younger workers. Talks about whatever the price can be instead of the true cost. It actually is restorative in health instead of depleting health. And it's got a more long-term view. Uh, so the story, the fish story is that the cod fishery in the Northeast Atlantic was the biggest fishery in the history of the world. 1988, fishermen could remember catching 5,000 pounds of fish in eight nets. And then in 1988, the fish were getting less plentiful and smaller. They were going from 25 to 40 pounds to five to eight pounds. And finally in 1997, there were no more codfish. It's gone. Cod, by the way, no, cod when you go is catch of the day. It's not codfish anymore. There's actually the Sentinel fish, Fishery Program in Canada. They send out two boats every day to catch 100 uh, cod. They weigh them, measure them, release them, one boat. One boat weighs them, measures them, kills them, takes out their inner ears, and sends them into the Canadian fishery. They're waiting for the ecosystem to come back. It's not making any progress at this point. So we may have killed it off permanently. Danello Meadows, who was a professor at uh, Dartmouth, did an elegant model to analyze this problem where she looked at the fish versus the fishing companies and their profits. And what she found was the profits for the fishing company were maximum right before the ecosystem collapsed. And the belief that by the fishing companies that growth was good didn't help the fish. The addition of new technologies did not help the fish. 75 mile drag nets, radar, refrigerated vessels, that didn't save the fish. The market didn't save the fish either. You know, you hear, well, the market will save the fish. Well, the market would save the fish probably if everybody in the world made the same amount of money, but since there's a disparity of wealth and the wealthy will pay $10,000 for the last fish, you can't, you can't wait for the market to save the fish. So in a presentation that I heard her give, she said, well, no, Eh, you know, the conservatives are bothered by that. You know, it's not growth, it's not technology, and it's not the market. Now I'm going to go over here and talk to the liberals, you know. While all this was going on, the uh, industrialized nations, the governments, were subsidizing the fishing industry and people to eat fish $7 billion a year. So government isn't the answer. So the answer is more control at a community level because the fishermen, fishermen know that the fishers are going down. That's where the control needs to happen. And the good news about your health is, at a local level, you have some control over this once you're given accurate information. But in healthcare, we have the same villains. Healthcare focuses on growth and not on efficiency, such as turnover and waste. We use technology without proper evaluation and diffusion. We believe that uh, people and employers will continue to pay the increased rates and shifts. The government, we believe that the government policies will continue to support these rates. We're guilty of everything that they were guilty of that killed the fish industry in the Northeast Atlantic. So my challenge to the medical profession is to focus on building a new system upstream that is based on primary and secondary prevention so that I can see organizations decreasing the incidence of chronic disease so that we can reduce recurrence of coronary events. So if you go into a hospital with a coronary event, you don't have another one. We want to improve organizations that are based on the premises of Sustain, of natural capitalism, so we substantially reduce our costs and create supportive environments for the healthcare workers. Most of the healthcare workers I know feel like those guys mopping up the floor. They're bailing as fast as they can. Because remember, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an organization that runs with Taylor management theory, it's always to the advantage of the company if they can get you to see one more patient or do things quicker. So, Remember the bodies in the river, causes of death? Engineers like to make assumptions. Most people in the room are probably familiar with CT scans. It's actually, they shoot x-rays through you and they count it at the other end, and then they rotate it and they get lots, and they're trying to solve the, the, the actual density of that one little area in your brain or your body. That's a matrix of equations that is unsolvable. But engineers in the 70s in England made an assumption that allowed them to solve the equation, and therefore we have CT scans and, and MRIs to these days. So we make assumptions. So let's assume, just for, as a thought experiment, 
and we talked to experts that 90% of cardiac disease, 50% of cancers, 50% of stroke, and 90% of diabetes is preventable. And let's hold the medical industry accountable for just 50% of that. Let's say we could design systems to accomplish that. I think we could do much better, but let's assume that for a minute. And then we calculate those numbers again. Guess what rises to the top? So if those assumptions are right, medical care is the leading cause of death in the country. It's going to be a long journey, folks. That's why I think you've got to focus on yourself locally and do what you can with the people around you, because I don't think this is going to get fixed. It's fixable, but I don't think it's going to get fixed. The good news is we've got a lot of very smart people, caring healthcare professionals, working as hard as they can, but they're working in systems that are poorly designed. And we're going to need money for innovation, and it's got to come from the current system. I mean, I, you couldn't go, given the, the numbers you saw earlier, you can't go ask for more money. We need to look at waste differently and need to work together as teams. So let's take one example. Welcome to Texas. Come for the ribs, stay for the angioplasty. In 2007, we did 1.3 million angioplasties at about $50,000 a crack. We killed 12,000 people doing that. We did four, about 500,000, 450,000 bypass surgeries, about $100,000 of surgery, and killed 15,000 people for about $100 billion. Assuming that 90% of those were for stable angina, that'd be a $90 billion savings right there. And my, and my feeling is that even unstable angina, which is that, it's a soft term, but there's some definitions for it. When you come in and you're having this chest pain, I would imagine, I'm hoping some organization will put a total quality management study together with patients' informed consent, of course, where they, instead of rushing those people off for their surgery, they put them in the ICU, stabilize them with drugs and diet, and see what it's, and then compare that to the other system. So that's a challenge for medical organizations. Finances will be a challenge. You know, prepaid health care, you get all your money up front. So if you do less, you make more. Fee for service, you only get paid to do things, so you've got to do more to, to make money. Now, this isn't a good or bad system. This is like Monopoly or Parcheesi. I mean, prepaid health care has got some bad things to it. If you deny service, for instance, that's a bad thing. Uh, but we do have to fix the finances a bit. There's a preventive medicine kills return business slide for the first day of medical school. I don't think I got that at Georgetown, but maybe I wasn't paying attention. I don't know. What I have here, didn't translate because I'm on a different computer, is a picture of a building that is being built at Mercy Hospital right down the street in Sacramento from where we live. It's a huge six-story building, and it's the Alex G. Spanos Heart and Vascular Center. The way I look at that is, I look at it as waste. I'm sure a lot of people drive by that and see it as progress. Wow, we've got a building here that's gonna fix heart disease, right? That's part of the waste in the system that needs to be eliminated. So, just a couple minutes, I wanna talk briefly about the Whole Foods program. Uh, Jeff alluded to that a little bit, uh, about Whole Foods trying to solve their healthcare costs. Uh, I got to take care of nine healthy adults, in addition to Ben, who you saw earlier, um, he was not healthy because he was on all sorts of medicine. But these people were all successful in lowering their cholesterol and their sugars. The thing is, in current medical practice, there's no value to make people who are healthy healthier. I didn't get rewarded for that. We used to have a system called multiphasic preventive care. We had five clinics in Northern California and eight in Southern California. They've all been phased out, except the original Southern California clinic, which is Vince Valetti's program a very gifted innovator and visionary. And that program, Vince is now retired, but that program is now being phased out. So Whole Foods is investing $4,000 per participant. That's how much they are believing and improving the uh, health of their uh, employees. The Meals for Health program you heard about, this is the uh, program we did up in the Sacramento Food Bank. It was a collaboration between the Food Bank, EarthSave, and the John McDougall Clinic. Uh, John asked me to do the clinical work. He said I, meet, I met his two criteria for the job. I lived in Sacramento and I'd work for nothing. <laughs> Very rewarding for me as a clinician to see these sort of results. It makes medicine fun, actually. And you can see average weight loss of 10 pounds, blood pressure's down, cholesterol's down, fasting sugar's down. 
and the progress has continued. And you saw the testimonials that Jeff showed from these people. And this is the numbers for Kimberly. She was the last lady who talked. Uh, numbers look good, but I think the stories you see are much more impressive. So you can help. You can change your behaviors to move toward a more plant-based diet plus vitamin B12s. Exercise, work to help family and friends change as well. Work with your healthcare professionals and keep current. I get a question, why doesn't my doctor know? There's no way your physician can keep up. 11,000 articles hit the literature every week. 20 to 30 journal articles per 365 days. Michael Greger, who reads all the nutrition literature, is reading five to 7,000 a year. So, can't keep up. The doctors can use your help, though. You can insist that they treat your diseases, not your markers. You can share with your physician your desire for health and minimal medication, and you can share with them the positive results, because most of the doctors I talk to don't think anybody's gonna do this. And we've also got data to show that doctors who practice this prevention actually make more preventive recommendations, and doctors who share their success stories about their prevention are more credible, and patients have more success. So there's very good reasons for doctors to do this. I will mention that the, you may have heard about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Forces. They come up with recommendations every year for what doctors should do in their practice. If the primary care doctors did that with their patients that they saw in a day, it would take them 7.4 hours. So it's not feasible to do that. So systems have to be developed and teamwork to support the doctors doing this, and you're a vital part of that. Finally, uh, Jeff wanted me to mention lab values. Some of you had some uh, cholesterol and fasting sugars done. And for those of you who have those, uh, for your glucose, you're considered normal if you're less than 100. 100 to 124 is prediabetes and greater than 124 is diabetic if you're on a fast. Just to let you know, we've actually changed that definition. It used to be 150. Then it went to 140, then it went to 130, then it went to 125. And we actually created the new diagnosis of prediabetes about six years ago. So a lot of the people who are diabetic in this country, we've actually created a market for drugs. Uh, and of course, the dilemma is, it's a, of course, it's a continual curve. There's not like good cutoffs in there. Lower is always better. Arterial disease, uh, the low density should be, shoot for less than 90, total cholesterol less than 150. However, there are some people who have uh, a lot of high density or good cholesterol running around, and that has to be looked at, because then you can look at the ratios to see how that works. Triglycerides should be below 150. So markers are useful. And you need to get this interpreted with your physicians because there are many factors that are, very, that are involved, but the laboratory events can vary from laboratory to laboratory too, so it's important to know the normals. Okay, so in closing, I don't know if I have time for a question or two, but just to thank these people, uh, one of them's coming up next, Jeff, uh, one of my favorite people. Uh, all these people have shared slides with me and made positive contribution to me in one way or another. Since the doctors can't keep up, you need to keep up. And if we're gonna keep writing the proper nutritional prescription, welcome to Swiney's, all you can eat barbecue. I'm Dr. Neil Barnard, I'll be your waiter and your cardiologist tonight. You know you've achieved a little bit of status in society when you're in the cartoons, right? So the three areas I would recommend that have been most used to me, nutritionfacts.org is Dr. Michael Greger's new website. And he goes around and gives talks. He's Probably as funny as Jeff is. Well, maybe not quite as funny as Jeff is, but he's funny. But he reads literature, and now he's got a website, and he's, he posts a YouTube video every day on a new topic, and it's very well indexed, so you can go down the left side of nutritionfacts.org and find whatever you're interested in and look at a short presentation. If you want the original literature sources, it's right below. If you click on that, it'll actually take you to the abstract or the full article if it's a free article available. It's a fabulous resource. He's totally overwhelmed. I offered to give him a couple hours help starting next month, answering some of the questions he's getting. John McDougall has a great website. He does a monthly newsletter. Uh, John reads medical literature for fun. I don't understand how you can do that. I mean, I like reading these articles too, but John just loves it. And he synthesizes that down and makes it very useful for people. So for types of medical therapy and should I be tested, I mean, an example is the vitamin D craze. You know, Joel gets up here and says 30 to 60 for vitamin D. And then Kaiser says you should be above 30. 
And then the Institute of Medicine says you should be above 20. And the, in Brit, Britain, they say above 10. So if you actually look at the literature and how these levels are determined, we really don't understand too much about optimal nutrition. We're not studying as well as we should. So John McDougall's website is a great website for this. And finally, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is one of the pro nonprofit organizations that's really making a difference. It's making a difference in health, and it's making a difference in legislation and policy, and also the science as far as the animal use. It's really a valuable organization. I do some, uh, uh, I occasionally do a radio show or, or get interviewed for their print media, occasionally do a presentation for them, but it's a good organization, doesn't cost much to join, and uh, uh, so I would urge you to use these sort of three things to keep current with what's going on out there because the science is always changing. So with that, I'd like to close. I, if I have time, I'd take a question or two, but thank you very much for your patience.